frankly, Japan was left in the dust. Ah. And now those innovations were all around hardware. Asia that thinks from a system perspective because you really have to think about the services and all the other things to create this ecosystem. New book, you mentioned a lot about painkillers. What's the difference between a painkiller and a vitamin? I think a painkiller is truly about solving a customer's day-to-day -day life. And at the end of the day, when you build products, ChatGPT is not going to find the next painkiller. はい、ピボットの竹下です。今日はですね、あの、伝説のエンジニアのトニー・ファデルさんに話を聞きます。トニーさんはですね、なんとあの、iPod、iPhone の開発チームを率いた、本当に Apple の伝説のリーダーで、その後もですね、自分で起業したりとか投資をしたりしてます。あとはですね、あの、今回インタビューでも聞こうと思うんですけれど、なんと1989年にですね、インターネットの前に iPhone みたいなものを作った、えー、ジェネラルマジックという伝説の会社があるんですけど、そこにもいた方です。で、トニーさんが最近、ビルドという本を早川書房さんから出しまして、真に価値あるものを作る型破りなガイドブック、まあ、ビルド、まさにものづくりということなので、まあ、彼の、まあ、この時代におけるビルド、ものを作ること、まあ、プロダクトだったり、人生だったり、会社だったりを作ることの、まあ、真髄を聞いていきたいなと思います。あとは、あの、Google で働いた経験もあるので、ちょっと Google の課題なんかも聞いてみたいと思います。では、早速、トニーさんとつないでみます。So, Tony Fadell, welcome to Pivot, welcome to our show. Hi, Ryan.、Uh, it's great to be here with your audience on Pivot. Thanks for having me. Likewise. So, I will just quickly introduce you to our audience. So, you are an engineer, designer, and also you are a best selling author of Build. Yeah. Are you excited yes. about yes, the, your Japanese version of your book coming out? I, I'm really excited. You know, I, J Japan was one, of my very, was one of my first travels outside of the US. Literally, Outside of North America, I travel e d a little bit to Mexico and Canada, but my very first international travel with a passport was to Tokyo、mm. back in 1992.、Mm. And I was blown away. My, my brain was blown away when I got to Tokyo. I was 22 years old and I had never seen any other place in the world like it. And I was like, I don't know anything about this planet. I need to start traveling. And so I started traveling all around, the,、uh, all around the world, all around Japan. And I was visiting Sony and a bunch of other big corporations back then. I loved Akihabara. I、like, loved it. Oh, you absolutely was amazed. <laughs> so、uh, you are、uh, the designer and inventor of iPod, and you co invented iPhone. And you also co founded a company called Nest, which is a thermostat company. So let me start your,、uh, asking you a question by what are you doing right now? What are you building right now? Well, I think, you know, the first is the launch of the, my book there in、mm -hmm. Japan、um, with the Japanese version. Actually, there are now under development or have shipped 31 other language versions of that book.、Mm -hmm. So, Build, we're, we're every week we're approving a new translation or a new, a new language to, to go to the market. So, we have 31 different、uh, editions of Build coming out in languages, even in Mongolian and Croatian,、wow. Ukrainian. So, it's pretty wild. So that's been taking up a lot of time. And then the other thing I've been working on is my portfolio of companies with Build Collective.、Mm -hmm. We have some amazing companies like Jet Zero. Maybe we'll talk about Jet Zero, but it's literally a replacement for all the planes that we fly today, whether on JAL or, or any of the other airlines, literally replacing those to make them green. So save 50% and、uh, fuel savings just by changing the design of the plane to look like a bird. Instead of a tube and a wing. <laughs>、um, what else am I doing? I'm designing new products. So I designed a new product with、uh, a company called Ledger、mm -hmm. that's all around、um, I, digital identity、um, and, and crypto, uh, uh, crypto assets. So that's coming out very soon.、Um, so that's Ledger Stacks. I've just been very, very busy just doing a lot of investing and working with the companies in our portfolio. We have over 250 companies that we have directly invested in around the world. Um, that are you know, helping the planet in some way with our, the climate crisis that we have.、Mm -hmm. uh, the, now we, we, and as well as health and,、um, and social, societal needs. So, those are things we're doing now. Wow. So, why do you think、uh, your book Build is popular among the international community? Do you think everyone's interested in building something at this moment? <laughs> well, we need to build a lot of things right, right. now. We have to reboot, we have to reboot our planet. 
mm. for climate for the climate crisis we're in. We have to change how we fly, how we float, how we drive on land. All of these things have to change. All the infrastructure of them basically needs to change how we fuel them, what have you. And so when all the materials we use, how we do our agriculture, so many, many things need to actually be changed. So we got to reboot this planet. So it's an incredible time to build, not just with electrons, but with atoms. The only way we're going to get through this climate crisis together and keep humans on this planet is if we build with atoms, mm. not just electrons. Well, so much before has been about electrons, electrons. We need atoms now. and We all need to work together to, to help solve the problems that we've created over the last 150 years on this planet and do it the right way. So, um, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's incredibly challenging. It's incredibly rewarding to be able to take all of these years of experience and work with these incredible teams around the world to try to, to help, mm. to really try to help. So you mentioned uh, you came to Tokyo first in 1992. Was that the time you were with General Magic? General Magic. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a long, long time ago. I had hair. I had hair back then. <laughs> um, but but um, no, seriously, I was there. And, and at General Magic, and there's a movie about it, and I think uh, and there is a Japanese translation. I, of the I movie, saw it, actually. Yeah. We were cre You've seen it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, there is a literally... Um, a movie about us trying to build the iPhone 15 years too early. Right. So literally 15 years too early. And we were, we, we were working with Matsushita. We were working with uh, Sony, Toshiba. Oh, the list goes on and on. NEC. Um, uh, so Mitsubishi, all of those companies in Japan at General Magic. And it was uh, obviously it was the biggest failure that had to happen. But we were trying to make the, the iPod, uh, or excuse me, the iPhone, 15 years too soon. We even did emojis. We created <laughs> emojis back in 1991 and 92, which actually NTT Docomo created the worldwide sensation that is, you know, that is emojis. Oh. But we did it just years before at General Magic, and we were working with NTT Docomo. This is a true story. We were working with NTT Docomo. And they saw emojis and they put them on that their NTT platform back in the day and their smart handy phone, I think it was. It was called. Wow, iMode, I think. Yeah, iMode. iMode handsets, exactly. Right. Amazing. For us old people who know who know those things. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in your book, there was a drawing of uh, Crystal Pocket, which was drawn in 1989, which is very amazing. Before Wi-Fi, before internet, before everything. So why? The Crystal Pocket, even though it was a very innovative idea, it only sold uh, 3,000 or 4,000, 5,000. Why was that? <laughs> yeah, so it was called the uh, General Magic uh, PDA or personal, the personal something, mm -hmm. assistant, digital assistant, can't even remember. Mm -hmm. And um, personal communicator, actually, is mm -hmm. what it was called. And we were partnered with Sony, and that was the Sony Magic Link. And we were creating, like I said, the iPhone 15 years too early. And it was so early that let me remind you what was happening on when we launched that. There had been no internet yet. There was no Wi-Fi. There were no data networks, mm. digital data networks. Most people weren't even using email yet. Mm. Nobody was doing online shopping or online travel or downloadable games. All of these things started to exist starting in 2000. Wi-Fi didn't start in the world until 2001. Mm -hmm. We didn't truly have data networks. Obviously, Japan had data networks before the rest of the world, but real data networks in most of the places, especially in the US, until 2005, something like that. Mm. So, so we were making all these things, downloadable games, all this stuff before the internet, before anybody even knew that e-tailing was going to be success, right? With things like, you know, eBay, which was actually created at General Magic. But we, we didn't even know eBay was. So we were creating this thing before the internet on analog digital, uh, excuse me, on analog telephone networks, mm -hmm. not even on mobile phone network. So we were solving a problem that had yet to exist for almost anyone in the world. Mm. So that's what's amazing. You know, you, we had an amazing idea. And many of those things were implemented in the Japanese carriers in iPhone, those kinds of things, much later. So just because you're solving a pain point, you need to solve one for people who 
have the pain point. Mm. Uh, we didn't even have the pain point. Mm. We didn't even have. We were just geeks impressing each other. <laughs> we weren't really understanding the market, the target customer, or anything else. We just believed that this thing had to exist sometime. We were just 15 years too early.、Mm. Do you think that was a failure, or do you think it was like an important first step for the world of iPhone and iPods? I think it was a first a important first step for us as、um, creators,、mm -hmm. as designers, as engineers. I don't think it was important from the market perspective.、Mm -hmm. The most important product of that time frame was the Palm Pilot. Ah,、mm -hmm. so that was the thing. It wasn't the Apple Newton. It wasn't the Sony Sony Magic Link. It wasn't all these things. It was actually the Palm Pilot, very very simple thing.、Mm -hmm. And then it became the BlackBerry. At least in the rest of the world, you guys already had lots of messaging with your、right. your your services there. But then for the rest of the world, and then it ultimately became the iPhone. But no, no, I think it, it it was very important to us who went on to know what we were trying to do and why we were doing it, and we knew we got the timing wrong. But we continued to move forward and. You know it, what turned into the iPod first, and then the iPhone. It really, and also remember, Android、mm. was also created at from a person who was at General Magic, Andy Rubin. So both iPhone and Android were both created by people who were at General Magic. Do you think it was just the timing? Because you know people or customers didn't even realize what the problem was. Do you think it was too fast, too early? It was way too early,、uh, and you cannot ship something. On, you can't ship something even to early adopters if they can't see what the problem was,、mm. if you what you were trying to solve,、mm. right? And so we were solving problems that no one had,、mm. and it wasn't until we were carrying in two thousand and five a laptop for browsing and productivity applications. We were carrying a cell phone. For texting and and some small media things, but mostly mostly、uh, com voice communications and text. And we we're carrying around an iPod for video and music and podcasts and those things. We were carrying around those three devices with all the chargers、mm -hmm. and batteries and all that stuff, cables. And so we came in and said, "Oh, now you're going to get this one thing in your hand that fits in your pocket." That does all of those things.、Mm. Now it might not do them as well as any one of those things, but it puts them all, so it's very convenient. And that's what's been. That's why General Magic or General Magic wasn't solving that problem, and iPhone was solving that problem that many people had because they were already experiencing it every day.、Mm. So a lot of our viewers of Pivot, they're all entrepreneurs, engineers. What kind of advice can you give them? I think they're literally building something at this moment when they're watching this video podcast. What kind of advice can you give to our audience? Well, I, I think you know one is I'm glad they're building. They, we need to be building more. Like I said, we need to solve many, many problems on this planet, and that's the only way we're going to do is solve it with with human talent.、Um, I think the first thing is we talked about timing. We talked about timing with General Magic. Make sure you're solving a pain that people actually have at the just before more people have the problem.、Mm. In other words, you don't want to do it just at the time people have played. You want to anticipate.、Mm. You want to be slightly early, not too late, or just on time, because that means you have lots of competitors. You want to be just early enough before the technology is absolutely everywhere. That's when you're solving a, you know,、uh, solving solving a pain problem. Pain point. So get the timing right. Make sure you are solving a pain.、Mm. Make sure you understand what it is you're solving, who it's who you're solving it for, and why it's a painkiller, not just a vitamin.、Mm. Something people truly need, whether they can understand they need it right now or it's something they habituated away. Something they had pain before, but because they didn't know there were any other alternatives, they. You know, they just said, "Oh, I'm resigned to only doing it one way,"、mm. and so they put that pain away. But remember, target a painkiller and do it at the right time, and obviously deliver a a, a really great solution、mm. for those people. So, in your book, you mention a lot about painkillers. What's the difference between a painkiller and a vitamin? Because when you're trying to build something, you know, everything seems important, and everything seems that will change the world. What's the difference between a painkiller and a vitamin? I think a painkiller is truly about Solving a customer's day-to-day -day life.、Mm. Okay, they have the pain every day. Whereas with a vitamin, 
It's like, you know, you don't always have to take them. You don't know if they really work. They <laughs> might be a trivial new feature or a new thing that people are like, oh, that would be interesting. But do they really need it? You know, to me, uh, and you can say this is, uh, you know, because I only look for pain. Um, I'm not into media apps or games or things of that nature. So I'm not going to speak about that. But when I talk about painkillers, I'm talking about things people really need. So I don't invest in social media networks. Mm. Okay. So to me, a vitamin would be like doing AI filters, you know, on people's faces. <laughs> Neat. But is that really a painkiller? No, it's a vitamin. Mm. And sure, that can be something interesting for people in that market. But that's not what I go for mm. because I don't know if that's going to be successful. I go where there's true pain, where people are like, you know, when you have a, you know, a, a headache or you have a backache or something and you need that aspirin or you need whatever that is medicine you need to get rid of that pain people need that medicine mm. right if you're if they need you know some extra minerals or vitamins or something like that they may not need them mm. they might not feel any different between them so i want to make sure i'm targeting a pain mm. and not trying to do some kind of interesting thing but not necessarily people thinks people need mm. and that's what i found through my my years mm. of looking at things and the painkillers are also about the features you put into the product, mm. right? You can look at Adobe and you can look at all the AI tools they're putting in their products now. For the people who use those tools, they might be vitamins, but for a lot of people, they're painkillers now. And that's what's amazing, mm. right? So they're not just adding features to add features. They're actually putting painkillers to people who might have been using Photoshop for 20, 30 years. And they finally got this technique, this the superpower that they've always wanted. Mm. How do you find the painkiller? Do you ask people, do you do marketing or do you ask yourself? How, how do you find it? Well, uh, I, you know, a lot of times the things that I build are the painkillers that I, you know, mm. I build painkillers for the pains I have. Mm. But then in other cases, I go and like, um, I look for pain. So in the case of Jet Zero, this new, this new um, jet company, um, you know, I looked at the problem of how do we get plane flights to be carbon neutral? Fuel is a big problem. And so when I looked at Jet Zero and I was like, oh, my God, they're solving, they're getting flights down 50% in fuel, Whoa. right? Regardless of the type of fuel, 50% less fuel necessary. And I'm like, that's a huge painkiller. One is you know, the price of your ticket, mm. right, uh, is going to be a lot less because the number one reason why plane flight is so expensive because of the fuel. Secondly, the planet's burning up. How are we going to solve the planet? You know, this is a big one. You, airlines want less, less cost in their flights. They want to be able to fly more and fly green. Okay, another reason. So you just kind of go through these things and you go, okay, that's a pain, uh. right? And you go, they're solving it in a very novel and disruptive technology way. And I go, that's what I want to invest in. Mm. So when you uh, designed and invented the iPod and iPhone, what was the painkiller back then? Well, you know, Sony solved this back in, <laughs> in the 80s mm -hmm. and I, that when I, with the Walkman, right? Mm -hmm. I could carry my music with me. Well, first it was cassettes. And so that was 10 songs or whatever it was. Then it was Discman, which was another 10 or 15 songs. And then you'd have to carry your cassettes or your CDs with you wherever you went. And then they did D Discman, uh, you know, the mini disc stuff that really never made it, made it across the pond, at least to the US. But then it's at... At uh, but the Discman was no longer pocketable, mm. and it was hard to say that the early Walkmans were pocketable. Right. But when you look at the iPod, it was number one pocketable, mm. and it's it hold it held at least a thousand songs when you started, and then twenty thousand, thirty thousand songs. So the pain you were sa saving was the stack of CDs or cassettes that you needed to take with you wherever you went, and so. Those are the things that, that was the pain. We all enjoyed music. We just didn't, we want to take all the music with us. Now today we have streaming services and we have an infinite size jukebox in the, in the sky. You know, we get everything we want. But back then the pain was, and this was for me, was I was a DJ ah. and I was carrying a thousand CDs with me, these heavy <laughs> CDs, right? Mm -hmm. Vinyl wasn't back in, even vinyl be even worse. But I was carrying all these. I'm like, oh my God, I can't stand it. So the pain was, <laughs> I didn't want to have to carry all these CDs with me to go to gigs and then ultimately individuals and myself when they wanted to listen to music in their car or when they were traveling or what have you. Wow. So you mentioned uh, Sony's Walkman. So 
uh, Japan used to be a country of builders, but right now it seems that Apple and Google is way ahead of us and also maybe open AI. Could, could, could you, do, do, what do you think what happened to Japan? Why are we left behind? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this goes back to my Akihabara story. Akihabara, okay. okay. So what happened was I would go into Akihabara and I would see all these crazy brands and all the stuff from the brands I didn't know, or I did know, like Sony, but they would have all these Japanese specific products, like mm. stuff I never saw, these pocket calculators and dictionaries <laughs> and, and, and home appliances, all these different home appliances. And I was like, oh my God, there's innovation everywhere. And I was like, this is amazing. And then what happened was, and now those innovations were all around hardware. Whoa. Okay, they were bonding different pieces of hardware. They did all the craziest stuff. To me, it was just a bunch of engineers putting things together, but they really didn't know what they were solving. They weren't solving for a painkiller. They weren't solving for any one person. It was just a bunch of engineers. I'm going to put all these bits and pieces together of hardware, and we're going to make something work. And I was like, the oddest stuff. I saw the weirdest stuff, and I was like, why that? Why that? Nothing made sense. And then as we started to get to the internet era in the 90s and beyond, it became much more software driven. Mm. It wasn't always like so because because Sony and, and the other companies, they did really well when they could add. They didn't have to really do much. It was all mechanical and mm. hardware. It wasn't about software. Then when software on devices came in mm -hmm. and that included even digital cameras, frankly. Japan was left in the dust. Ah. Oh. Like it just didn't have the software chops. It didn't understand how to build operating systems. It didn't understand like when TVs became shifted from being hard, you know, mechanical electrical products mm -hmm. to much more software, again, left in the dust. And that's why, you know, you had to use all, you know, Sony PlayStation was the first thing really, from my point of view, mm. PlayStation was the very first thing that actually had software that came out of it. Even Nintendo 8-bit, that wasn't real software. Uh, Nintendo 16-bit, not real software in my, from my standpoint. Mm -hmm. The real software platforms came with something like a Sony PlayStation, right? And then you started seeing that. We saw this with the Sega Genesis units. We saw this with uh, Super Nintendo. It was, I tried to do Sega Dreamcast <laughs> programming. I was actually a Sega Dreamcast wow. and Sega Saturn programmer back in the days. And my brain would hurt to try to program these Japanese because it was just a bunch of hardware glued together mm. and you had to solve all the software problems, each person uniquely. PlayStation was the first platform from, from anywhere that I look at from Japan where they actually thought about software. Everything else was some form of Windows, DOS. There was the NEC DOS. There was all this stuff. But it was all just kind of copies. Sony PlayStation, the first software that finally start the mar map and you know, and now Sony has software, but you know, you still go to sharp TVs or whatever else. Mm. Now it's owned by Fox. So, the, the software revolution never really, really went to Japan. And that's why I think it got left in the dust. And when you go to Akihabara now, you don't see all those weird little hardware things because those all got killed. And now you see mostly rest of the world that are software driven hardware pieces, right? right? So, whether that's, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, iPhone or Android things that come from China or Korea, you know, there's a couple from Japan, but not like they like, like the Japan cell phone market used to be. Mm -hmm. It was only Japan cell phone, mm -hmm. right? You could buy them from only Japan, Japanese brand. So I think it was really that transition. Internet happened, software happened, and all that's, you know, Japan was left in the dust. Unfortunately, there is an amazing, gr brilliant people there, but somehow software just didn't come back to didn't ever come to life there until the PlayStation. Wow, it's interesting you mentioned about the shift from hardware to software because you know your title of the book build it seems that building something is building hardware but so you're using the word build as a more wider concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I'm the first guy I love hardware, but I know how hard it is to build and I always talk to all my 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 companies the possible investments I make I'm like why do you need hardware? Hmm. I don't want them to use hardware if they don't need to. 
Mm -hmm. But I do think things like in the climate crisis, we need to build hardware. Right. But we need to build it smartly. We need to understand how to do it the right way, not the old way where it was, you know, we created everything from scratch and then more software on top of that and everything else. You need to, if you're going to do hardware, you have to make sure you really need it and you better do it top, top class and, and understand how to make it in a, you know, in a system in a modular format so you can build on top of it over time. Mm. But I think of systems. And remember, the iPod wasn't just a piece of hardware. It was iTunes and the iTunes Music Store. It was a whole and a whole world of content. That was a system. iPhone wasn't just iPhone hardware. And this is what Jap Japan and even Korea gets wrong, China too. It's not just iPhone. It's iPhone plus the, um, uh, the App Store, all the apps on top of it. All the services that come with it, whether that's iTunes, music service, all that other stuff, the cell phone, mo you know, your data service, and then now iCloud and financial services and everything else. It's not, it's, it, it's the thing you have in your hand or in your brain that you think of the, the, the atoms that manifest this entire system of things to make it work, mm -hmm. right? And there's very, very few things even coming out of, like I said, Asia that thinks from a system perspective. That's not just, uh, you know, well, here's a piece of hardware that fits into this in this thing, because you really have to think about the services and all the other things to create this ecosystem. Mm. And the hardware could drive it certain times, but it's not the only driver. I see. Uh, so before going to the next question, uh, what was like working with Steve Jobs? What kind of leader was he? Uh, he was obviously very driven. Mm -hmm. He was a driven guy. He knew what he wanted. He. Um, he was always someone who was pushing the edge and not afraid to, to, to challenge what engineers and the other expertise around him when he didn't have the expertise, but he had enough of, he had enough of curi enough curiosity to ask why over and over and over again. Mm. So he'd go, well, why that? Why that? And then he would compare it to other products or see other things and go, well, why can they do it? You know, so he was always so curious that he could challenge the team and he wouldn't just take whatever the team said until he was thoroughly satisfied that um, it really truly couldn't be done. And there were good. We learned through those those um, those discussions. We learned why we couldn't do them. Right. As opposed to just because most people, their knee jerk reactions is, no, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and you couldn't do that around Steve. You had to really prove that you couldn't. Yeah, because I think most people, you know, if you want to invent an iPhone, they will just put plastic on it instead of a glass. So was he the person like, trying to push hard to create the perfect uh, product? Um, I think we all were. Mm -hmm. He would push in his way. We'd each push in our own ways. You know, once you get that bug of, you know, how can we get there? Mm -hmm. Then it's just a matter of, you know, maybe we won't do it this year, but we'll do it the year after, mm. or we'll research that. It's because we always knew we needed to ship, mm -hmm. right? You always need to ship every year. You can't just sit there and wait for the perfect, perfect, because right. you don't know what perfect is to so ship. So I think we had this really nice rhythm of, of, of continuing to push ourselves, but not push it too far that we didn't meet our kind of annual, um, annual refresh, product refreshes that we needed to do. Mm. So that was really great with Steve is we could always find a, a, a good working pace, even though it was really hard, that would we could bring new innovations out and some real hard innovations that uh -huh. could take two or three years to make happen. Mm. Uh, I want to ask you about Google, your experience with Google, because in your book you mentioned a lot of, about Google, because your company Nest was bought by Google, and a lot of our viewers are starting to build their companies and build their culture. It was interesting you mentioned that you know Google used to uh, Google offered like free lunch, free massage. But it's a great thing for the employees, but at the same time, it can also destroy the culture. Could you elaborate on that, your experience? Yeah, uh -huh. um, I think the way I think about this is that you have to make sure that you are treating your, 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 your workers, your mm -hmm. engineers, your designers, all the people in your company, you treat them well. Mm. But it doesn't mean you, that you coddle them or baby them or... or um, spoil them mm. what can happen is what you want to do is you want to be, you make sure you have a good working and a constructive in, environment working environment for people you want to make sure they have the best tools to get their job done but it doesn't mean you have to then give them everything so that they feel like they're going to you know they, they get everything from the company mm -hmm. they get like they basically the 
the companies like their parents mm. and they can say anything they want of their parents and their parents become, you know, give them everything. You know, a good parent doesn't give everything that a, a child wants. <laughs> they know what things to give them and what things. What happened was you get in a, a spoiled culture. People become spoiled and they say, I want this, I want this. And they become entitled mm -hmm. and they think it's their right to have all these things. And they forget that these are privileges and nice things to have that they're given. Mm. So you always have to balance this. When you have a kid, you know not to give them stuff, every single thing they want because they get spoiled. Well, that's exactly what happens in cultures. This is just human nature over and over, mm -hmm. even with adults. Adults can act this way. I've seen it so many times. So you have to have a good thing of understanding what your benefits are for, for, for employees. Benefits are things that benefit not just the employee, but their families. Perks usually do not benefit their families. Hmm. Perks do benefit the, the individual at work at the time that they work. And that doesn't help their family. So that's usually a really good dividing line. Give them great benefits, but watch out for the perks and only do the perks uh, sporadically and make sure they don't become an in, they don't become a right and an entitlement for people. Hmm. They should be nice surprises for people. Hmm. Because in your book, uh, it was interesting, a uh, worker in Google asked for a yogurt during a meeting on Friday. So, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 is that something? Yeah, yeah. A, a worker in the middle of 60,000, 80,000 people on a, on, a, on, a, on a video conference. And this person <laughs> says, you know, my problem is, is I don't get the type of yogurt I like anymore. It's like, <laughs> really? That is, is going to rise to the level of this incredibly important meeting that you were having? Those are the kind of things where you go, oh, okay, there's something, there's a problem here, mm. right? Yeah. Any advice for our viewers who are like trying to build their own companies to, yeah. I think they should rebuild. Mm -hmm. And two is make sure that they, they, they spend the money on the things that really matter for the customer, mm. right? What matters to make sure that the employee has good benefits to help their family, those kinds of things. And then make sure that they're doing the right things, getting them the tools, getting the information so they better understand the customer so that they can make good decisions every day to make that product or service the best for that customer they serve. And then guess what? The revenues grow in the company. That means people can get paid more. That means we can hire more people. You can do more good things. And then that continues to go. Don't spend all of your hard money hard-earned money on perks that really don't matter. Hmm. So for the final part of our interview, I want to ask you about building your careers. So you right, talked sure. about, yeah, you talk a lot about mentors. So what's your experience with mentors and why it's important in one's life? Well, very, very, very importantly is you don't know everything, hmm. especially around you, human nature. You know, it takes, there's a reason why there's something called wisdom hmm. and wisdom is understanding the nature of the beast is understanding you've seen so many things and understanding human nature, understanding how people interact with each other, different cultures interact with each other. And wisdom is all about learning that. And that takes experience. And that makes people, it takes people who have spent a lot of time. You're not going to get this from chat GPT. <laughs> all right. It takes people who really can understand your point of view, understand the problems you're having and try to map that onto their experiences onto what you have to help you. So, Great mentors don't know everything about your business. They should know everything about your business. They, you should know everything about your business. Great mentors help, help you with the human nature aspects of your business, how to lead teams, how to lead meetings, how to grow teams, how to hire, how to fire, how to deal with a board meeting, how to deal with customers, how to think about marketing and sales, all of these other things from a human nature perspective not from a technical perspective. Hmm. And when you, you, you want mentors who have had these experiences, so mentors would typically be at least your age or older than you, and they come from a different walk of life or they've done a bunch of things differently. And that's what's important so that you can have a sounding board when you're going through these things, you can talk to them and they can try to get to understand you and what you're trying to do. And that mentor needs to be curious about what you do because you're also helping them too. So it should be a two-way street. You're teaching them, they're teaching you, and you're learning things that you wouldn't learn because you need more experience. And they're learning things up the, up the minute, things on the technical side, other stuff. So 
a, a great mentor and the mentors change over time mm -hmm. is someone who's going to help you with the human nature aspect, not the technical aspects of your business. Interesting. Who is your mentor? Well, my, the reason why I wrote Build mm -hmm. was because most of my mentors had died. Uh -huh. And so because of that, I, I wrote the book. So my, you know, Bill, Bill Campbell, um, Steve Jobs, um, some people early on my career, actually from General Magic, one person from General Magic, Phil Goldman, he died very young in his 30s, but he was a mentor to me. So I just had a lot of different mentors over time. And uh, I wrote the book to honor them because now I am a mentor. Mm. I, that's at least I think. And I'm trying to give back to everybody because I'm only sitting here talking to you because people help me make very difficult decisions to be able to get to where I am today. So that's why I'm speaking to you. And now when you get to a certain status in the, in the, you know, in your, in your industry, you need to give back just like people gave to me. So I'm, I'm doing this, the book and speaking to you and, and making sure it's translated in all these languages is to give back to, to, to everyone so they can learn what we've learned so they can make the world a better place and have better teams and better companies and, and build the things we need to build for the planet we need to reboot. I, I really appreciate it. So um, it's, Surprised me you mentioned about human nature because you're in the tech world, you build a career in the tech industry, and you didn't say chat GPT, but you mentioned human nature. You, you need human nature. Look, at the end of the day, chat GPT is a reflection of us. It's not a new human and a new human with all these new thoughts. It's a reflection of us. Maybe it has a lot more data in it mm -hmm. than any individual, but it still reflects us. And at the end of the day, when you build products, chat GPT is not going to find the next painkiller. Mm. It's not going to solve new problems that it hasn't seen. It's going to solve things that we've already seen. We need to continue to move forward and, and, and build the products, find the solutions to problems that we didn't know exist, right? That's the difference. And ChatGPT is not going to change that. It might help us do those jobs after we figure out things that are, we need to solve, but it's not going to go and find those solutions necessarily. And, and find those insights and those painkillers. So that's what we still need to do. And, you know, low level software work, yeah, maybe be it replaced by chat, mm -hmm. something like a chat GPT. But the high level architecture of software and what features should go in and, go, you, know, you know, which one should go in or which, how it should change or how you should architect the APIs, chat GPT is not going to do that anytime mm -hmm. soon. Thank you. So I think we need to wrap up. Do you have anything to add? Or, yes. Um, a final message to our, viewers i think that mm -hmm. you know uh thank you for reading build mm -hmm. hopefully you read build hopefully it hopes it helps you in some way it's all about human nature human nature is the same i've gone all around the world mm -hmm. invested in companies been with biz building business all around the world human nature is the same regardless of culture and so just remember that when you're reading a book like build it, remember the human nature aspects of your teams your companies yourself, as well as the products and the customers you serve. Mm -hmm. It's not just all about technology. It's also about how the human element, the things that AI doesn't get right, the emotional intelligence that we have as humans and relating with other humans, whether inside our companies or outside, make sure you're always looking at that aspect. It's not just about technology. Great. Thank you, Tony, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thanks to the whole audience, and I hope you guys uh, enjoy Build. Yeah.